Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ron Marks. Uh, I'm the 2020 Spring Dole Fellow here uh, at the University of Kansas, the Dole Institute of Politics. I'd like to welcome you uh, today to uh, the sixth uh, of seven seminars that we're doing on spying in the cyber age. Uh, I'd like to thank the Dole Institute for getting us through an extraordinary time uh, and some great efforts on the staff part there. Um, also, I thank Newman's Own, uh, who's been kind enough to uh, to sponsor this uh, throughout uh, throughout all seven seminars and again on their support. The purpose of this series uh, has been really to look at the exploration, the collection and gathering, the sense making of information in the cyber age. Um, we've looked at different aspects of it. We've had people in from CIA who were looking at the talent of the future. Uh, we've had other uh, people in here who dealt with uh, the policy makers at State Department, but also uh, in their world of uh, the contractor world of, of uh, say, a Raytheon, uh, Randy Ford, the Honorable Randall Ford. Um, we've had people who've talked to us uh, about the legalities of this new cyber age and what that all means in terms of, not only in terms of collection, but in terms of international structures. Um, we've had uh, certainly one of the, uh, one of the founders and movers uh, in open source intelligence, uh, as well as certainly a uh, expert in the analytical field, Dr. Mark Lowenthal. Um, and then last week, we had uh, what I would consider the equivalent of a CIA spy, a case officer, and her name is Jenna McLaughlin, who is the chief national security correspondent for Yahoo News. Uh, in fact, uh, doing what, uh, what I used to do for a living, which is hunting out information, trying to make sense out of it, uh, and presenting it uh, to, uh, to the public, but in a very different way than, uh, than I would have, say, 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, the vast amounts of information available to her. Uh, today, we're very fortunate uh, to have a gentleman who I've had the pleasure of knowing for some period of time now, almost 25 years, uh, Dr. Greg Treverton, uh, who really is, uh, is an analyst, a futurist, and uh, really is looking uh, at the, has been looking at the, at the cutting edge of the cyber age in terms of not only the information itself, but how it is affecting the institutions within. Um, Greg has a long and, uh, and storied history within intelligence and policy making. Uh, he was a, a young staffer on the Senate Intelligence Committee when it was first founded uh, as a way of overseeing uh, American intelligence. Uh, he was involved with the RAND Corporation for a long period of time. We'll be talking a little bit more about his career here shortly, so I'll just give a little thumbnail. Uh, currently a professor of practice out at uh, USC, enjoying the sun in California as we speak. Uh, and also uh, currently the co-founder of the Global Technical Politics Forum, uh, of which I'll fair advertising. I sit on the board of advisors and we'll talk a little bit about as, as Greg tries to see into the future with regards to the institutions that we have taken for granted for 75 years who may not be around much longer based on our new cyber age. So also, and I can never forget these things, I always promise uh, when these happen, I would like to recommend his book, uh, Truth to Power. Uh, I don't get a cut out of it, I swear, uh, but an excellent book uh, that he wrote with, uh, with Bob Hutchings on the, the history of the National Intelligence Council, of which he was the chair, vice chair once, uh, chairman uh, throughout the Obama administration. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what that's all about as well. Greg, listen, thanks a lot for being here today under some, some very difficult and peculiar circumstances. I'm delighted to have you here. Well, it's great to be here, Ron. It's great to be with you and with the Dole Institute. I'm sorry we're, we're not doing this uh, physically in Lawrence, but uh, it's great to do it anyway, and thanks for making it happen. No, I'm delighted to do so. And again, thank you for, for being here. Uh, what, I, what I like to do is really sort of start off, we're, we're talking to a lot of students out there. We are others. But it is a universe, and I always like to make sure that uh, that young people in their in their late teens, twenties, as they're approaching this this big gap called adult life and uh, and working uh, uh, working later on, perhaps certainly in the cyber age, but certainly perhaps a desire to work in intelligence or other areas surrounding it. Uh, how everybody got involved with it? So how did a nice guy like you get involved in the, uh, the intelligence business here? <laughs> That's a great question and uh, one that uh, you shouldn't quite believe the answer to. I suppose as far as students are concerned, it was mostly serendipitous. Maybe you'd say sort of putting yourself in the right position. So when you had a good break, that happened. So I'm finishing my dissertation at Harvard on policy making and foreign policy around the president. And I get a call one day to, from the Senate Intelligence Committee, the first select committee, the church committee, the investigation of intelligence in the 1970s. Would I come down and talk to them about working for them? I suppose a faculty member of mine had recommended me. 
So I uh, went down to Washington and had a conversation with a great, who later became a great friend and colleague, David Aaron. Mm. Uh, and I thought it was going to be a very preliminary conversation. Uh, at the end of the day, I suppose, desperation on David's part. He said, uh, come down two days a week if you can, five days a week. So I said yes eagerly and started coming down to Washington. I almost didn't finish my dissertation. This was in the days when dissertations were done on paper, basically. <laughs> Most of the students won't even remember that, right? Uh, but uh, I almost didn't finish it. And, but finally I did and went down and started working full time. So it was a fascinating introduction for me. And then I went from there basically after a little break to work on the National Security Council uh, handling Europe. And I noticed that when I'd have interagency meetings, they were all these uh, uh, bright young people about my age around the walls who didn't speak. And I finally realized they were mostly CIA analysts and they could be enormously helpful to me. So uh, that sort of got me hooked on intelligence. It was a good set of nice breaks. And then I later had the opportunity when I was back teaching Harvard to create a program on intelligence and policy. So I suppose the lesson is mostly uh, serendipity happens, mm -hmm. but maybe as the saying has it, if, if you uh, put yourself in the right position and put yourself with the right uh, set of capabilities, that probably does increase your chances of having some good breaks, which is what I did. Well, you certainly took, took good advantage of them. Let me, let me ask uh, about a couple of those positions, because I think they're, they're interesting in terms of framing our further conversation. So what's a NIC? Uh, what, what, uh, what, does, what does a NIC do uh, when it's all said and done? I, National Intelligence Council analysts, uh, you certainly held the head job or in the head shed for, for the better part of six to eight years. Uh, so what, what, is it, what does it do and what is it, what is it that you had to do in terms of, uh, in terms of managing the place? So that's a dangerous question because I could talk about it until tomorrow, right? So the NIC, the National Intelligence Council, has been around, mostly subtrained, not well known in Washington even, for 40 years. Uh, this telling truth to, to, uh, to uh, policy was uh, my, our effort to try and summarize some of that history in a useful way with reflections from people who have been chairs over the years. Basically, it has always been the director of first central intelligence, now national intelligence, interagency arm for analysis. So if the president wants to know, not clear this president wants to know much of anything from intelligence, but in a normal time, if a president wanted to know what the CIA thought about Russia, he could just ask. But typically the question is, what is the intelligence community? What is the set of analysts in all these agencies what is their view of a particular issue? That comes to the NIC. So then what happens is the NIC is organized like a little State Department with national intelligence officers for regions and functions. So the question would then go to the right appropriate NIO, national intelligence officer. He or she would convene the community of analysts on that subject from all the agencies, the main ones being CIA, DIA, FBI, NSA, INR and NGA, but depending on the subject, lots of others as well, and they would decide how to answer the question. The big change for me, when I was there in the 1990s, we were mostly in the strategic intelligence business, not always looking far out, but often trying to stretch out a couple of years, but trying to put issues in context, trying to say how important they were relatively, trying to look around corners a bit, uh, and that's what drives me. The big change this time around in the Obama administration was with the creation of the Director of National Intelligence, the immediate policy, intelligence support to policy, passed from the CIA basically to the NIC. And so in all those policy meetings, I'm not sure these policy committees meet at all anymore, but in the Obama administration, the principals committee, that is the cabinet secretaries, they met pretty often. Their deputies, the deputies committee met all the time, every day. Uh, and so that generated a great stream of questions, uh, what are called in government ease, taskings for us to answer questions. Uh, and so by like, last year, I think at the NIC, we did about 700 pieces of paper or oh sets of bytes on computers. 400 of those were questions that more or less came directly from the National Security Advisor, for deputies or somebody from the NSC. 
Uh, they were not all purely tactical. Uh, some of them were int very interesting. Many of them were in just the kind of things you'd like intelligence and policy to uh, interact on. Uh, questions like, if we do X, how will Putin respond? Right. Good questions. Uh, but my challenge, so my, you asked what my role was. My role was to turn these people loose, mostly great people. <laughs> uh, and I would always say to them, I've got your back. Uh, I've always got your back. If I can help you, I'm happy to, but mo mostly just go do it. And I don't expect to see you very much. And, you know, uh, but my task, as I thought about it, was really to try and find ways for us to have time and capacity to answer the question we were asked, but then say, no, here's a slightly more strategic question. Not just how will Putin respond, but how does this affect the set of things that is on Putin's mind, his objectives, the nature of his interactions with the people around him, try and raise it a bit strategically. So that was my main task when I uh, worked on uh, all the time, basically. If you could talk a little bit about the difference, I, sometimes I think analysis is viewed as prognostication uh, in the sense of, you know, you get your crystal ball out, kid, and tell us where we, where we go from here. Talk a little bit about that I, I, in terms of what, what do you expect of you as, as someone who obviously was the customer at the National Security Council and on Capitol Hill, um, but also as the guy who had to draft this stuff and now, and now deal with these ridiculous people at, at in the Congress and then on NSC. Um, what, what, what can you give them? What should you give them? What's a good customer? Well, let me, let me put it that. What's, what's the atmosphere here that, we, that would be really good to have? Well, that's a great question. I, I've probably bored my colleagues uh, too much with the distinction between puzzles and mysteries. So I find that useful in thinking about intelligence questions. There are some that are puzzles that we, uh, there is an answer to, we just don't know it. During the Cold War with a secretive foe, the Soviet Union, there were lots of things that had answers. How many warheads does an SS-19 missile have? Things like that, that were puzzles. Uh, we spent a lot of money with sophisticated systems trying to solve those puzzles. So there are puzzles, and there's still puzzles around. Right. Puzzles about you know, Kim Jong-un's nuclear program in North Korea, lots of puzzles there we don't know. Uh, but for me, the more interesting ones are mysteries that don't have an answer. You know, we don't know uh, what President Xi in China is going to do next. He probably doesn't know, know either, right? Right, uh, no, may not. Yeah, so there, with mysteries, you say, well, what's, is there some relevant history? Do we have some sense of what the political system from which this is going to emerge looks like? You try and put those things together. What you're trying to do is help people make sense of a current and future that is important to them. We like to get it right, right? We like to uh, uh, make predictions, but it, but it isn't, and we can't hold ourselves and shouldn't be held to the prediction. Uh, it's really trying to help people better cope with uncertainty, to maybe narrow the bounds of uncertainty, recognizing that we're not gonna make them go away, <coughs> but basically saying, you know, this is probably more likely than this. Uh, and we, I often worry that sometimes we pay too much attention to probability and not enough to consequence. So right. something very consequential and we don't know how probable it is or maybe it's very improbable, probably still needs a place in the analysis because it's important. The main, I think the main point, sorry, the main point is really to, <clears throat> to help people, help policy people deal better with a world that's inevitably very uncertain but where they're looking for some help, maybe some signposts, uh, maybe some cautionary advice. Yeah, the question I was gonna to ask too is, is based on all that, the difference when we were dealing in the early 90s with a lot of classified information and NSA and CIA and, and, and you know the challenges of, of the classified system and why it's classified, et cetera. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff out there now. I mean, you've got policymakers who in their own way, or many people in their own way, can simply be their own collection agency and their own analytical agency. How do you deal with that when you've got a very different kind? You were really in the middle of the, the, middle of the vast change there. When, when you start going from a system where classified is a big portion of the system 
to a system where maybe not so big. And, and there are a lot of different diffuse, sometimes true, sometimes not, as with all information uh, coming into not just to you, but also to the people who are, who are, your, who are the customers. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a really a, a wonderful challenge. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a, in some sense for me, a great challenge to have where you've got this ubiquitous information out there, right? We were worried in the Cold War because we had too little information. Right. Now we're overwhelmed by it. But that a, a, seems to me a, a better position to be in. But it does mean, both, as you say, both you have policymakers who have lots of sources of their own. Uh, Mr. Trump seems to care a lot about Fox News, right, which is a right. challenge in and of itself. Uh, but they've got lots of sources. Even Colin Powell, when he was Secretary of State, he abolished the, a good publication, I thought, the CIA, the uh, INR, State Department Morning Summary, uh, because he thought he didn't need it. He had plenty of sources on the outside. So that means that there is more stuff out there. And that then I think makes me think that the role of intelligence changes in a couple of ways. One, it plays, it seems to me, a much more validating function, right? Uh, I remember senior policymakers telling me years ago, can you help me understand when I read something in the New York Times, is that right or wrong? Right, how, how right. How reliable is it? So that sort of validation function, I think, is more and more important. The other thing I think that changes in the intelligence business is, I hope, I know, it will continue to produce exquisite products for as far as the eye can see. But in some ways, the nature of the business seems to me to be changing in that it's becoming, as far as analysis is concerned, much more a kind of client service enterprise. Uh, that if you think about NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, used to have these wonderful products, now many of which you can get for free on Google, right? You can right. get oh, yeah, satellite absolutely. photos. And right. so thinking about how they add value, uh, I think is a, is a critical task looking forward. When I was a, a, a vice chair of the NIC 20 years ago, I had uh, one good insight. I, I realized one day that while I thought our product was national intelligence estimates, sort of our premier written products, I realized that really our product was national intelligence officers. It was these people, experts in a position to have conversations, to buttonhole people in elevators. And in those conversations, they didn't have to be too, too careful about what was intelligence, what was policy. They could just be helpful. Later on, I had the chance when I was at RAN to uh, look at uh, some oral histories the CIA had done about the use of the president's daily brief that uh, morning book, the most expensive one since Gutenberg, I suppose. <laughs> uh, we could talk more about that if you'd like. But sure, uh, right. <laughs> uh, the, they had had oral histories from people in the administrations before, the three administrations before Obama. And what was interesting is the seniors that talked about it all liked the brief, but they liked the briefer better. Right. Because the briefer right. was the introduction to a conversation. They could ask questions. They could get experts to come and talk to them. Uh, and that seems to me to be a, a, a big, big part of what this future world is going to require for intelligence. Let me, let me pick up on that theme a little bit and also back to reference to the book in terms of telling, telling truths to power. The intelligence community has had a, somewhat of a reputation over the years of, of being able to walk into an office and, uh, and upsetting policymakers because, well, they didn't quite agree with them. Uh, there's a wonderful picture of, of John McCone sitting with Lyndon Johnson uh, as uh, McCone was leaving as director of CIA and essentially having just dropped the report in his lap saying, by the way, that Vietnam thing is going to take a million troops in 10 years, at least in our, in our estimate. And the, the look on Johnson's face uh, was not a happy one. Um, as you have done that over time, and certainly in your position on the Hill or in your position in the, in the NIC, what do, you, what do you do when you've got someone who looks across at you? Um, I, I'll dare, dare take up a recent name, John Bolton, for instance, who could be quite a difficult customer. Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Is that just simply we, we lay out the facts and, and, and the devil take the hindmost? Or can, can you engage with a customer like that? Or is it uh, just better to let the facts speak for themselves? I think, well, it obviously varies from case to case. And in the end, you really have to let the facts speak for themselves. It seems to me what you can do is a couple things. I've found that sometimes uh, policy people will accept bad news better 
if you've used some method, right? If you, you said, this comes out of this technique we've used, uh, we've done factions analysis or some other technique, and this is the conclusion we get. I remember doing that in the, in the Clinton administration. Uh, we had a factions analysis that said, what would it take to change Milosevic's objectives in Bosnia? And the answer was something that nobody downtown wanted to hear. It was, it's going to take airstrikes on economic targets in Ser right. Serbia proper, which we did five years later. Right. Five years before, nobody wanted to listen to that. So I thought sometimes the method helps. Uh, other times, uh, trying to find ways to, I, mean, I always tell analysts, you don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about the people you're trying to help, but a little time is good, right? And so if you right. can imagine uh, something that will make this more acceptable, more palatable, or more receivable by a policy person, I think that's useful. Uh, in this administration, I'm told that the President's Daily Brief for Mr. Uh, Trump is basically a table mat with lots of graphics uh, and, you know, don't want to pull punches, but he's probably the president we've known who is most allergic to bad news, right? Right. No president likes bad news, but he, he shoots the messenger. Um, so uh, a little care in that, you know, it's there that you get into the delicate of area of, am I polit being politicized? Am I cooking right. the books a little? Uh, and that's something that I think mostly the integrity of intelligence officers won't let them do. But it does, it is, it's, it's an enduring challenge. Sometimes I think, as you suggest, you just have to lay out the facts and say, <clears throat> this is the best we can do. If you don't want to listen to it, we've done our job. You know, one of, one of the people who was um, has been interviewed in this process, and I won't and I won't mention who it was. In fact, uh, had uh, a deputy national security advisor actually call up and try to get them fired uh, for what it is that they uh, they said. Uh, so yeah, I, I understand it was it was, uh, but again, the analysis you know did prove out uh, there is always policy successes and analytical failures. That seems to be the way the way life works. Moving ahead just a little bit in terms of looking at uh, the future, and I and I swear we'll we'll get to to some of what we were talking about in terms of the forum. We are clearly running into a lot more transnational issues now, uh, not just how terrorism, but obviously we now have the have the bio threat, et cetera. Where do you see this game going in the next few years in terms of what what should a young person as an analyst be thinking about as they as they want to come into this game? Where do you see the community now sort of moving in terms of what it is that, that they need to watch for. We're always sort of fighting the last war, I guess, but uh, mm -hmm. what, what, uh, how, do you, how do you see the next five years, say, in terms of, uh, in terms of sort of a reworking? If you, were, if you ruled the world at this point, how would you be reworking uh, working the U.S. intelligence community? Well, it's, it's a, obviously a complicated set of things. So as we moved from a period when we were very focused on a transnational set of threats, terrorism, to one where now we're much more concerned about tra more traditional nation state threats, though manifested in different ways, gray zone or hybrid threats and warfare. Uh, so it's, a, it's an, in, an interesting, a fascinatingly complicated world. Now we're recognizing again, belatedly, how important uh, something like pandemics, which has been, as we've said, the existential threat, but we haven't had to deal with it in quite this way. So. It is going to be, it seems to me, a, a very complicated and interested and interesting and difficult world because we're trying to deal with all these things at the same time. So dealing with pandemics means we've got to cooperate with China. On the other hand, the body politic in the current circumstance is pretty hostile to China. Uh, and so navigating that for policy is hard, but for intelligence is, as well. So I think it's going to take intelligence into um, more preoccupation with uh, newer areas. I hope we, we paid a lot of attention to pandemics and uh, global issues like water and food, right. before, but not enough. Uh, I, one of the things that gratified me at the NIC was uh, when I talked about these issues, often with people like the director of AID, they would know NIC products much better than I did because they liked them, they were unclassified, they can use them. So I think that's going to take intelligence. You know, it's not going to be the primary intelligence role, but it's going to take more in that direction. So from, from the perspective of a, somebody thinking about intelligence, it seems to me it, it, it means there are lots of new opportunities to 
apply expertise in different ways. There's the whole emphasis on data. I hired a data scientist to work in my Africa account. That was a really interesting experience, experiment. So I think it means that, they're, that it's going to open up. And I hope, you know, we've been in a period when intelligence has been taking its hits, particularly from the president. And that's, that's a shame, a, yeah. a big shame for me, because uh, I don't want people to be discouraged. You know, you go into intelligence, you pay a price in money, you pay a price in lifestyle. Right. The patriotic young people are prepared to do as long as they feel like they're doing good and appreciated. But if they're not, uh, that's my worry. But because I think this, this world is going to be a fascinating one for intelligence, not always a pleasant one, uh, but a fascinating one that's going to take it in both new subjects to look at and, as we said earlier, new ways of trying to add value to the policy process. Much more interaction with people outside the government, with right. private sector actors. Uh, that's unco uncomfortable for intelligence agencies, but it is very much a part of the future. Well, speaking of the future, you founded this last year, uh, and I guess it had been somewhat ex in existence, but nevertheless, I think you've, you've pushed ahead the Global Techno Politics Forum. I looked down just to make sure I get the name right. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Really, a, really a look at uh, looking at, at institutions and at the body politic of the future and the cyber age we are in and what kind of changes are are going to be made. If you talk a little bit about that, you know, you're, you're, where, where, where are we going here? It seems like the multinational institutions that we'd counted on since World War II were shifting. American power seems to be, uh, if not going away, certainly becoming, uh, becoming a less strength. Um, uh, political uh, institutions, uh, business institutions, all seem to be changing. Uh, your, your thoughts on that, Greg, in terms of where, where, are, we, where are we going here now? And again, why, was, uh, why did you put the forum, forum together? Oh, thanks, Ron. The, the uh, idea behind the forum is basically to work at the intersection of technology and geopolitics. The, uh, the assumptions behind it are basically that uh, there are really important new actors, uh, especially the private sector, especially tech giants, not new, but newly salient, that are geopolitical actors in their own right. Uh, they're gonna, uh, not going to go away. They're going to be here. Yeah. Well, ditto as we've seen in the COVID crisis, while the federal government has been a muddle, uh, the states and localities have sort of marched out. And so we know that, that cities are going to be geopolitical actors in their own right. Los Angeles has a deputy mayor for international affairs, right? Yeah. Uh, and that is, is part of the future. So recognizing that they're important new geopolitical actors this is driven very much by technology, but the interaction of technology and these actors, that was the motivation. Our sense was that, that also that we were kind of stuck in a 20th century set of tools. You know, there's going to be regulation and the tech giants are going to take a beating, but probably less of a beating now because they're going to be the heroes, right. the heroes so far of, of COVID. Uh, but that, that, that wasn't the right approach. So what we really needed was to recognize they were important stakeholders, uh, that borders are less and less important, uh, and that what we needed, therefore, was a more international, more cooperative approach. So that's our goal. You're exactly right. We've known for a long time that the Bretton Woods international institutions haven't kept up. They haven't kept up to the rise of China and India, um, and other emerging powers. And they also haven't accommodated the fact that now the private sector you know, when the Gates Foundation spends more on health in Africa than the World Health Organization, yeah. you know that existing international <laughs> institutions are not exactly right. So uh, what is really the ultimate purpose of the forum is to help reimagine global architecture. That's awfully grand, and I hope we can make a little contribution. But that's the task, and that's the task in front of us. No, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it will. In fact, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to helping you in that process. In fact, it's a it's an excellent idea to, at an, at an excellent time. Let, just one last question. I, this is this is pure prognostication on your part. Um, where wither the U.S. in ten years? Is is this the uh, you know? There's always uh, 
we, we've been condemning this country for forever and a day in terms of its power. Uh, there's a joke about a character in The Godfather. He's been dying for the last 20 years. Uh, where, where do you see the United States now, in, uh, say, in a 10-year period of time? Lesser power, same, greater? Uh, where are we going to a multipolar world? Or what, 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 uh, what are your instincts, uh, your experienced instincts telling you now? It's easy for me. I think it's easy, maybe too easy for me to be pessimistic at the moment. This has not been a great period. We've sort of fumbled so badly, we looked like the negative of leadership. We look like we're completely incompetent. Uh, if there is a rejuvenation, it seems to me, it's not going to be in the ways that you and I grew up with. It's not going to be big federal programs. It's not going to be, it's going to be new interactions between governments and the private sector. Uh, it's going to be new partnerships across 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 territory between cities and others. Uh, it, that seems to me to be the the, the hopeful signs of the future. Um, we've been talking about the wane of the nation state for a long time. They're not going to go away, but we found that, particularly in our case, it's it's not uh, likely to be the solution to our challenges ahead. And if we're going to stay together. I worry sometimes that the country will come apart physically. But if we are going to stay together, it's going to be uh, through kinds of cooperation and ventures that I don't think we've even imagined. Uh, my imagination says that 20 years from now, we'll look back and say, gosh, our use of even the terms public and private in this 2020 was kind of quaint. Um, that's, my, that's my hope. Good. Excellent. Well, listen, thank you, Greg, again, for, for taking the time to come with us today, again, under some very difficult circumstances. Uh, a thanks to the Dole Institute, again, for, for arranging all of this, again, under some, some challenging circumstances, and to the Newman people, of course, for continuing to fund all this. Next week will be the final seminar. Uh, I can't believe it has passed uh, that quickly, but it is. Uh, the 22nd, uh, 4 p.m. Central, we're going to welcome uh, Mr. Shelby Coffey. Um, Shelby is, uh, is a, a friend and uh, uh, sometimes one forgets when one talks to friends exactly what they've accomplished in their lives. Shelby was uh, not only an editor for the Washington Post, uh, but the three-time Pulitzer Prize winning editor for the LA Times uh, about where uh, Brother Treverton is, uh, <laughs> as well as the vice chair or the, uh, the vice chair emeritus of the, uh, of the museum. Um, he's coming here to talk a little bit um, about the subject of information itself and how you can be, how we're all now our own editors uh, in an age in which information once upon a time flowed through some very narrow pipes and, uh, and there were keepers at the gate, but not, not the case anymore. Uh, so shifted in a very, very different uh, time. And uh, Shelby has written on the subject. He's gonna be talking to us about it. So again, thanks to everyone out there and uh, thank you, Greg, again, and to the Dole Institute. Uh, My pleasure, for, thank you, Ron. Oh, you're entirely welcome. We, uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, next week. Take care and, and please stay safe. <laughs>